Hello everyone, this is Dr. Andrew Chrysler teaching EE4418 at Idaho State University. In this lecture, we'll be covering chapter 4.5 on frequency modulation and phase modulation, two types of nonlinear angle modulations. You can follow along in the fifth edition of the textbook on pages 219 through 224. So to start with, let's recall our previous discussions, which included looking at amplitude modulated waves and the amplitude modulated wave we have some message mt which is linearly modulating a cosine wave with carrier frequency omega c and when we did this we uh, generated this double sideband suppressed carrier message and that message had some bandwidth and that bandwidth was 2b on uh, at negative fc and positive fc and that bandwidth is takes up some room and we knew we know that bandwidth is expensive and we don't want to waste bandwidth. So the idea that we should be thinking about is how could we reduce bandwidth? So one thought is let's consider some nonlinear angle modulations. And if we take a nonlinear angle modulation, we could say that we have some phase modulated wave and instead of multiplying the message by the cosine wave, we would take the message and we would linearly change the phase of that cosine wave. So we would have our carrier frequency omega c times t plus some phase modulation, which is some constant kp multiplied by the message. And that would give us some phase modulated signal in the frequency domain, and it would have some bandwidth. Now, if we look at this, we could see, well, hmm, what if we made Kp very small? What might happen? Would we be able to make Kp so small that the phase modulated message essentially has a bandwidth of zero? Is that really possible? Could we transmit a message with a Kp that's so small that we aren't actually using any bandwidth and thus we're saving money? Well, the answer is no, we cannot transmit a message with zero bandwidth. But the reason is going to be a little bit complicated. In order to understand the reason, let's first learn about a new concept called instantaneous frequency. So to understand instantaneous frequency, let's consider some general sinusoid wave, and it's going to have the form phi t equals a cosine theta t. Now, theta t could be anything. Let's consider two cases of theta t. On the left side, let's consider theta. That's just some wavy line that it changes. It could be anything. And then on the right side, let's consider a special case of theta t, where it's a linear line, just like the ones you learned in algebra. It has, it's equal to omega c times t plus some intercept omega naught. Now, stop the video and think for a moment. What is the slope of graph 1 and what is the slope of graph 2? Well, the slope of graph 1 is going to be a derivative, and so is the slope of graph 2. But on, this, on graph 1, that derivative the, of the angle is going to be changing at every single moment. So every single moment on graph 1, we're going to have a slightly different instantaneous frequency. But on graph two, we can see that because it's a line, the slope is going to be the carrier frequency omega c. And so it's just going to have the same instantaneous frequency no matter what the time is. So that leads us to thinking a little bit more. If we know the instantaneous frequency of, a, of a, some signal, could we find the angle? And the answer is yes, we could find the angle if we knew the instantaneous frequency. And to find that angle, we would need to do an integral. So if we integrated uh, the instantaneous frequency from minus infinity to t, we would be able to, with some variable alpha, we would be able to get the, the angle theta t. Now, if we have some instantaneous frequency and we don't have any information before time zero, we could just integrate from zero to t still using that same variable alpha.